Next, we have Maureen Miller, Chief Executive Officer of the Ontario Stone, Sand, and Gravel Association. You see from the bio that prior to, to Maureen joining the OSGA, she was Vice President of Land Worldwide for Lafarge, the world's largest construction materials producer. Maureen worked internationally with legislation, rehabilitation initiatives, community affairs, and sustainable development through the 75 countries in which Lafarge operates. Maureen is a geologist and a licensed landscape architect and has over 25 years of experience in the rehabilitation and restoration of industrial landscapes. She's also a commissioner in the Niagara Escarpment Commission appointed in 2003. It's great to have you, Maureen. Thanks, Rob. Um, thanks to everybody, and thank you so much for inviting us today. Um, I was just saying to somebody, I feel pretty old today because I know somebody at almost every single table in the room. So either, either I get around a lot, or or we've been dealing with this issue for a long time. So, um, I have uh, some slides here today. I'm going to go pretty quickly through these, so uh, please bear with me. So today I'm going to talk about four main topics. I'm going to talk about some facts and some myths. I'm going to talk about the provincial legislative framework, and I'm going to talk then about my favorite topic, which is opportunities and challenges that this, uh, this brings to us. So the OSSGA, uh, we're a, a set of member companies in the province. We represent about 75% of the tonnage produced. We have 100, uh, 100 active members and 170 associate members. Many of our members are here today, and they're here because they're interested in this issue and interested in um, having the dialogue with you. Uh, we work, uh, again, uh, very collaboratively with uh, communities, with the province, and with municipalities. Um, safe to say, it's an interesting point, uh, about 900 operations in the province produce about 75% of the tonnage. So we have uh, over 6,000 licensed or permitted pits and quarries in the province. So uh, we have a lot of sites that are busy and a lot that aren't. So here's myth number one. I wanted to talk to you about this. Ontario as aggregate industry sees its licensed pits and quarries as repositories of excess construction materials. Um, our industry does import excess soils into licensed pits and quarries for rehabilitation purposes under the current provincial legislation and municipal guidelines. We support a balanced and strategic solution that uses excess construction materials to their highest and to their best use. Um, sites that have many uh, that may have been licensed pits or quarries in the past and are now rehabilitated are sometimes used as fill sites. We heard about several of those this morning. Um, these sites are no longer under the management of our industry members in many cases, and this creates a pretty negative image of what we do. I was glad to hear Bev talk about the site in uh, Skugog because it was a pretty well rehabilitated site, and uh, it got covered up. So that's, uh, that's a challenge for us, but many times we, we get the old abandoned aggregate site attached to us, so we have a, a challenge with that. Myth number two, materials being imported into licensed OSSGA member sites may not be properly tested. OSSGA members are required by two provincial acts uh, to properly test and identify all the materials come brought onto their sites. Virtually all OSSGA members have stringent company policies to address the importation of fill. In many, in many cases, given the significant gaps and challenges associated with the management of excess soils that have developed over the years, many of our members have just decided not to accept any materials until the broader provincial and municipal requirements are, are addressed and, and, uh, and dealt with. So having identified these two myths, um, you, w we do need to recognize that there are many uh, licensed pits and quarries across the province that do accept fill um, under, the, under the provincial and municipal guidelines and are accepting fill right now. They do that for basic rehabilitation purposes, but there are many sites that are also being filled from right back up to their original level with fill under the existing regulations and guidelines in the province and the municipalities. So I'm not here today to tell you it's not going on, but it does go on um, within the provincial framework that we're going to talk about. So here's a legislative framework. Um, I was glad to hear also that uh, this morning in the opening comments, somebody said that we're highly regulated. Uh, these are uh, six of the 25 different regulations that we work under. Um, in this case, we consider those the most important. So we are covered under the Aggregate Resources Act, of course, but we are also under covered under the EPA in, in Reg 347, as well as the Brownfield regulations. So we're uh, ARA licenses and permits are, are prescribed instruments under the Brownfield regulations, so they apply. We also deal with the OWRA and regional and municipal official plans uh, uh, last but certainly not least. 
So let's uh, talk about the AR a little, ARA a little bit. Uh, under the ARA, detailed site plans of each pit or quarry are required to be developed prior to approvals being granted. And they outline the entire extraction process and define the rehabilitation expectations. We cannot get into the details of this today, but I can tell you that the current site plans under the ARA are very detailed and contain many of the elements that are also proposed in MOE's draft, draft best practices document. Importation of fill must be identified for on-site plans and must meet the requirements of MNR's policy 60003. Uh, MOE sign-off is, is also required. The materials being imported must also meet Table 1. However, um, significant areas of Ontario have background levels, uh, soil levels that exceed Table 1. Um, and any licensed pits or quarries in those areas could receive site-specific approvals and exemptions to match the incoming materials with the background of the site. You've heard a number of other people talk about that today already. Um, it's important to understand that there are many site-specific variations across the province. This is a big province, so we have lots of soils and we have lots of geologic conditions and it causes lots of challenges um, um, with, with the, the tables and how we judge um, what fills should come in and shouldn't. Um, but MOE and MNR, I think, have, have tried reasonably well to, to recognize this, uh, this variation. So if we talk about the brownfield regulations, um, ARA licenses are covered as prescribed instruments. So once a pit or quarry is finished um, and the license is being prepared to be removed from the site, the municipality can trigger a review under the brownfields regulation through a zoning change. At that point, MOE regulations would require documentation and testing of any off-site materials brought onto the site. Details of where they're placed and in what volumes uh, would all be considered under the overall framework of the Brownfield Reg. Um, that should all be taken care of previously under the ARA, but if it wasn't, uh, we were sort of doubly covered. Um, all the current parts of that reg would apply, including the tables. Once again, important to understand, major variations across the province, so that makes uh, implementation of this very difficult. So, very quick trick through the, red, the regulatory framework um, and on to something that I'm more interested in talking about, which is the opportunities that this, uh, that this gives us. So, as much as this is a really complicated issue and it's a province-wide issue, uh, we also see it as an issue that has profound opportunities, uh, both from a science and from a collaborative uh, perspective. OSSJ members would like, like to be part of that solution. We bring to you today some of the things that, uh, that involve all stakeholders to make this all work better. So we think there's a bit of an opportunity to clarify the province's role in the management of fill. Um, from our industry's perspective, there's room for much coordination at the provincial level. Uh, for example, ARA site plans already include many of the parameters listed in the soil management BMPs that are out for comment. Using this existing platform of documentation would probably be better than creating a duplicate document, certainly in pits and quarries, um, under a different provincial mandate. Both ministries could collaborate and reduce uh, overlap and, and duplication. There's also an opportunity at the provincial level to use existing regulatory requirements to provide certainty. I've heard lots of people say uncertainty today. I think what we're here to talk about is certainty. And I think that we can, we can do that, and we can do that in a very public manner. Um, ARA site plans are already public documents and available publicly. Um, our industry would probably be willing to work with government to provide a public platform to store information on fill uh, that's being brought into pits and quarries and provide better access and information to the public. We're all looking for the certainty, and this material is being moved and stored safely within the guidelines that are established. Is, that's what we're looking for. So on the municipal side, um, the same type of opportunities exist at the municipal level. Because this is being approached uh, with all stakeholders together, and this is a great example of this today, um, the municipalities have a large role to play in creating comprehensive, clear, and strategic policies. All of us involved in this process are, again, looking for that clarity. We think there's also an opportunity for municipalities to determine how the material is moved, who participates financially, and how the fill is managed over the long term. If you're a municipality managing fill in the Oak Ridges Moraine where the geological deposits make your soil very permeable, you're going to have different goals on how material is managed than a municipality in the city of Kawartha Lakes on a limestone plain with, with no overburden. In essence, uh, many parts of this activity lend themselves to locally suitable solutions, and many of these will cross municipal boundaries. Municipalities working collaboratively with their municipal neighbours will find a much better solution if they manage the landscape, not the boundaries. So there, there are obvious synergies and opportunities to look at it as the actual materials and, and where they could be placed. Um, 
are there aggregates or potentially construction materials, in, is a better term here, that could be recycled more effectively? I had a chance to talk with Councillor DeBearmaker over lunch, and one of the challenges that our industry has with the Leslie Street spit is we believe there's materials that are being added to the Leslie Street spit that could go to a, a, a licensed pit or quarry or an aggregate recycling facility and be recycled and put back into the process. We, we support the activities and the, the, what the SPID has, has achieved, but we really think those materials should go back into the, into the process. Um, and, and one of the reasons we need to do that, um, I think Chris talked this morning about the six million cubic meters of fill that's being moved around. So I did the math, that's about 12 million tons, plus or minus on a dry day. Um, really important to understand that all of the municipalities involved in this issue are also members of the top 10 producing aggregate municipalities in Ontario. Um, 12, 12 million tons of fill, GTA alone consumes 60 million tons of aggregate every single year. So even if we took all that fill and took it all back to pits and quarries, honestly we wouldn't make a dent in it. So we have a, we have a balance here that we have to achieve and that, that's what we're all struggling with is trying to figure out how we achieve that balance. Um, we also think that maybe there's an opportunity to take the stream of clean fill and construction materials and have a target that diverts it mostly, if not all, from landfills and towards a suitable fill site or a recycling location. Um, these two points alone are going to get us a lot closer to knowing how to use all these materials to their highest and their best use. We have an opportunity, as we discussed, um, uh, to ensure that the fill goes to the right places for the right reasons. Placing fill with good drainage capabilities in, the that, in an area that has drainage issues uh, may in fact improve the use of the, uh, this, uh, the capability of that land. Placing fill with good water retention capability in an area that may also improve the use of that land by retaining moisture. And, and new land uses can be created with fill. Um, creating urban recreation activities such as ski hills is valid. Um, you know, it's probably not all of our gig, but um, any of you that grew up in the Brampton area, you might have learned to ski or, ski or snowboard on Mount Chinkuzi. Anybody from Brampton? So all you have to do is go there and you realize that Mount Chinkuzi isn't a real mountain, but it is a real piece and a cultural entity and a big part of the recreation for the city of Brampton. So um, as much as we, you know, we, we need to remember community relevance and, and what they need in those communities. So uh, how does the agri industry see the opportunities? Well, we think we have, um, uh, our industry is a pretty willing partner in this matter, and many of the municipalities here today have good working relationships with OSSG member companies. Um, excess fill can be used in our licensed pits and quarries to greatly increase the capacity of those lands to perform at a higher level. Topsoil can be used to increase topsoil depth, or in older sites to replace topsoil that has been gone for decades. You know, in 1965, uh, you could sell topsoil from pits and quarries. Uh, we haven't done that for many decades, but many of these older sites don't have any topsoil anymore. Slope length and steepness can also be modified to create landforms that are closely aligned with the surrounding landscape. But the greatest opportunity that we see in, a is in some comprehensive plans for fill management is to start to work more actively in regional landscape management. Our vision involves looking at regional areas of aggregate extraction where municipalities can make strategic decisions about the post-extractive landscape. And then it makes sense for local communities, but also contribute to regional targets. Potentially, there's a place for, for fill in these. Um, I have some examples now to show you of some of these opportunities. This is a, um, this is a working vineyard in a working quarry in uh, Vineland. Um, this is a site that uh, is uh, owned by Walker Aggregates. The site's been rehabilitated to a vineyard after you, so it's actually producing wine and, and stone at the same time. Um, it, there were additional soils brought into this area to, to plant the, the, the vines. Um, that material, if it could have come from a, a fill opportunity from another site, that would have been a win-win. Um, so those are the kinds of things I think we're looking at, increasing the capability of the soil with an with a, um, inert fill. So another example, this is a working tender fruit orchard. Those are, uh, those are sour cherries in blossom, I think, in early June. This is in Niagara. Um, this, this orchard is also in an operating gravel pit, operational since the 90s. Um, it too has had agricultural soils added to, to, uh, to create the, the orchard. Um, if it had been available, if those soils had been available through excess soil or ex excess fill, um, again, it would have been a, a good permanent home for the suitable soils. 
Now this is a site in the Greenbelt um, in the Oak Ridges Moraine. The site was rehabilitated and cancelled in, in 1996. When it was cancelled, the site was growing well. You see it here, it's reasonably green. And the newly rehabilitated areas seemed to, to be doing pretty well. And they were gaining ground in the droughty, sandy soils. Um, we have to remember the Oak Ridges Moraine, pretty tough environment for, for vegetation to grow in. So we have a real challenge there. And as despite the best interests of the landowner that now owns it, um, this is what it's starting to look like. And this is a result of three years of significant drought on this person's property. Um, some real challenges keeping this soil growing. So if there was an opportunity there to add more topsoil to these areas to, to make them grow, um, it would be really helpful. Here's another site. Uh, this is in the Oak Ridges Moraine. This is, uh, as you can see, a very large, I hope you can see the, uh, the bulldozer on the slope. That's a, it's a small D6, it's not a D9, but uh, it's, uh, this is a reasonably big slope, so very, very deep site. Um, to complete the rehabilitation in any other way than this, um, they would need additional overburden in topsoil. So there's a good opportunity here to do more landform replication. Um, this is a, a pretty sterile slope that's being created here. It could, it could have a lot more going on it, but they have to cover the soil with the topsoil that they have. So bringing topsoil into some of these sites can be really advantageous. This is an interesting project we're working on. I was really glad to see that there's members of the of Uxbridge Naturally and Ontario Nature here today. Um, uh, our industry is working uh, collaboratively with Ontario Nature. They've engaged in a project um, in the Uxbridge area with Uxbridge Naturally. A number of the, the people involved in that are here today. And it, this is a really great example of where we can look at regional management of these landscapes. So this is a, this is a, a spot, some of you may know this, this is Coppins Corners in Township of Uxbridge. Um, you can see the numbers there. There's seven licensed gravel pits in this photograph. And one of the things that Ontario Nature has been exploring is how, how do we start to look at bioregional landscape planning, looking at uh, ecosystem planning rather than site by site. So we've had a great opportunity to work on this. Um, we haven't talked about uh, using uh, importing fill into these sites, but as we look at the final land use and work with the township to see if that's what they want, um, there may be an opportunity to, to make that work on a bioregional perspective. So, this is my last slide. Challenges. Now that we've had some opportunity to consider the legislative framework and some of the opportunities, we can move on to discuss some of the challenges. Um, these challenges are significant. Um, the issues surrounding excess soil continue to grow as the volume of these materials increases. Without a common goal, this issue is just going to become more challenging. So I would, I would say there's an elephant in the room today that we have to talk about how we manage the, the finances of this. Um, who should be involved in importing fill? Right now, it's the disposer and the receiver of the soil. Um, how can and how should municipalities explore a revenue stream for this activity? Our pers perspective is that how the finances of moving and storing this fill uh, will define, to a large extent, how it's managed. Managing the full life cycle of building cities includes these costs. We can't forget about them. And uh, we think that there's uh, a, a requirement to have proper management that needs to include enough money in the system so that it attracts and retains reputable community conscious companies and municipalities that want to work collaboratively with them. What's the, what's the proper testing regime? We've talked a lot about this today. Um, how many tests do you run and what do you test for? Um, I would tell you that I think there's not enough money in the system. A triaxial load of material coming into a, into a fill operation today might, might, caught, might net you $70. You still gotta play the truck driver. A, a, a single suite of tests for table one, $600. So what we're creating is a system that doesn't have financial back basis. Um, that, that load should be worth $700 so that, that everybody can be honest and test their system, test their products appropriately. Um, to continue on the topic of testing, our industry strongly questions the use of the tables and the brownfield regs to determine fill quality. Um, I, I would strongly recommend to municipalities that we, we develop some other system or some other management, some other process in, in order to gauge whether materials are inert or not. Um, the permeability of the soils and the destination isn't even addressed in the tables. So if you have a site that, you, that has permeable soils, you probably want soils that you bring in that are going to match that. Yeah, the, the tables don't, test, don't touch that at all. We don't have any documentation to support that. And lastly, 
Um, the success of all these solutions to this issue will not be found in creating individual systems in many jurisdictions spread over one regional ecosystem. The solutions must embrace the municipal boundaries, but they also need to recognize that to manage the excess fill properly, it's got to be managed as an ecosystem so that, it'll contrib that, that it will contribute to. Only then are we going to be able to be successful the for the communities that have stepped up to solve the problems and accept the fill. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.